Just listen. Part of the world is in search of awareness because we've become dominated, I'm talking very generally, dominated by thinking, thinking, the age of reason. That's why I found a lot of philosophy are actually very sad because they're trying to unthink the problem, which they can't. It's there. You can't unthink death or suffering. Good morning, Dr. Jonathan Mach. Thank you so much for, for giving me your time today and thank you for, for uh, agreeing to do this uh, episode with me. My pleasure. Um, I'd like to start off just to give the people a bit of a background. Um, you're a psychiatrist, and I think you're so much more than that, um, strictly speaking, in terms of the methods of healing that you apply both to yourself and to your clients. Do you want to just chat a bit about that and how you got into that? Yes, um, I chose psychiatry as a medical student because I believe in having a broad margin of life. And psychiatry allows one to get out of the constraints of, let's say, surgery or cardiology. And uh, I just like the, the philosophy of, of psychiatry, but based in neuroscience. So I'm, a, I'm trained as a scientist and as a medical doctor. And also, when I made my decision about 1982, that the neuroscience, the, the brain science was starting to explode and um, starting to understand brain better. In fact, Bill Clinton called the 1990s the decade of the brain. I th don't think that optimism has been reached because we know, of course, a lot more about the brain, but it's still a tiny speck in what we have to understand to, to make to make the appropriate uh, changes in health. And I think that's an important thing is differentiation. I'm moved from illness, brain illness, to optimizing brain health. Yes. And that's been a, a shift. And, and that's what I've always been interested in is, is how do you optimize health and specifically optimizing brain health. And there is a uh, a thread that runs through my career of stress and that began actually when I was a science student when I did a project my final project was on the adrenal glands oh, yes. of five different animals okay. and um, and how the stress hormones chemicals are released in the fight or flight phenomenon that is so well known to stress researchers and I didn't realize then, as a young, I think 21-year-old, that I was going to have a career in stress. And when I was a medical student, uh, I became president of the Students' Council. And one of the interesting features of that was that a number of female students were complaining about harassment in the hospitals. And uh, the Me Too movement didn't begin a couple of years ago. It, sexual harassment was then, and I guess maybe throughout history, but that led to a, a very interesting uh, survey of over 2,000 students. And it did show that uh, there was harassment, sexual harassment in, in, in the wards, and that went to the highest levels of the university. Um, and there's many examples of this where stress kind of just follows me and it sits on my shoulder. And, yeah. um, in 1994, I was in private practice and I started to measure stress levels, a unique curve, the mock stress curve that's now automated online. And I sent it to the Chief Executive Officer of Clinic Holdings, which is the precursor of Netcare, the late Barney Hurwitz, who phoned me up I just sent him a, a letter or that I was doing some research and he said, 
I want you to start a stress clinic at the Mill Park Hospital. And I kind of fell off my chair, as yeah. as it were. And um, they are started at, at one of the most prominent hospitals in Africa, a stress reduction clinic. And um, gave me insight into a lot of the stress-related illnesses that occur, uh, from asthma to heart disease, uh, arthritis, high blood pressure, depression, trauma. And that lasted for close to 20 years, and um, I decided I had enough because <laughs> I, was, I was starting to burn out. Yes. And, um, and uh, I went into teaching. And I, um, I, I taught at a Keso uh, for eight and a half years until a few months ago. And that really got m my thinking. I mean, eight and a half years of teaching with a lot of research and, and refinement of concepts um, and really getting to the cutting edge of where's the best in the world on, on, on mental health, not mental illness. Mental a lot health. of people confuse mental health with mental illness. Most of... Most of the time we're looking at mental illness, um, which is when the brain, as it were, when the chemicals, I mean, a neuroscientific, yes. um, uh, is disturbed, or perhaps more from an Eastern perspective when there's increased suffering. Um, and so I, I decided, no, I, I need to have a a break from this teaching from the hospital get out of it and start exploring in a deeper way mind body phenomenon which i've been interested in for about 25 30 years yeah. but how does one take the theory and put it into practice and i realize that it's much more than just meditation or more than exercise but also about relationships and the food we eat, and how we de-stress. And the science is starting to, to, to come through now. Although psychiatry, in a way, is a very difficult science. Very, very difficult. Because, let's say compared to a heart. A heart you can, in fact, I thought of one time going into cardiology, but it's very mechanical in a way that... You know, you've got a heartbeat, and you've got a conduction system, electrical. You've got valves, you've got the muscle, you've got the arterial system. And if you look at a cardiologist's practice now, they've got all these machines that can yes. measure and pick up and show in real time. Psychiatry, you've got a big, big problem. You've got the problem of consciousness. You've got the problem of the subjective view. And that's difficult to measure, but it's real. And how you are subjectively, how you feel subjectively, affects the chemicals of the body. And if you take meditation, for example, which is a focused type of attention, you focus your mind on something, it's been shown that you can change, I mean, with lots of practice, of course, yes, yeah. you can change brain structure and function. Yes. So... One thread I've been following um, is the Buddhist approach and yeah. the Dalai Lama um, together with quite a few European and American researchers have looked at Buddhist practitioners who practice or have practiced at least 10,000 hours of meditation. That's like a few seconds. Yeah put that into an hour times yeah. 10,000 yeah and uh, Davidson Richard Davidson uh, at Wisconsin and about 19 other 20 universities and brain institutes have done a lot of research on these let's call the Olympian yes level practitioners and so significant differences the problem there, of course is but what about the average practitioner like myself maybe a few hundred or a thousand hours does it show that's still to be seen um, but I become now going forward is deeply interested in how one can use the mind to change the mind or brain to change the body and also to change relationships 
And how do you access, how can a person access deeper parts of their brain, the subconscious, the unconscious? And, um, you know, this mindfulness, which is all the rage now, which is unfortunate, it's becoming a bit of Mac mindfulness. You know, yeah. anybody can become a mindfulness practitioner. Yeah, yes. But uh, it's a deep, it's complicated. But the more I practice, as Gary plays, is the lucky I get. In other <laughs> words, there's just, you become more aware. And mindfulness is really, in a way, is just being aware, conscious of what's unfolding moment to moment. And it releases you from the past and the future. So that's more or less where I am. I, I come from a, a medical scientific background into formal psychiatry where the DSM-5, the Diagnostic Statistical Manor, uh, Manual, yes. fifth edition, gives you about 500 conditions. You know, go tick, 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 which I guess algorithms and, and AI, artificial intelligence, will disrupt. Yes. Uh, that became boring to me. And in a sense, in private practice for 30 years, it's very difficult to slot people into each one. The insurance companies want this, but, uh, but, but the human condition, the human mind is so much more complicated, so much broader, so much deeper. And how do you capture it in a few symptoms, yes. um, in a few sessions? I don't even know who I am uh, in a sense that the more I practice, the more I start to understand myself. And it's like, you know, it's like going down in a big house you bought a big house with lots of rooms and there's one room, I once had a dream about this, there was one room in my house where you lived before that I've never been into before. And it was just incredible what was in that kind of attic. Yes. And as you, you know, and how do you capture that within, you know? So, and also, also, also of course, how we age and how our genes play out through our ages. And perhaps, what motivated me predominantly, I would say, was my father getting early dementia, a peculiar form of dementia, not that, that uncommon, but he, he was a medical doctor for 58 years. And in fact, he worked till two days before he died at 83. But he lost his geographical memory. What that means is if I ask you, for example, how did you get here from your home? So in your mind, you can tell me oh, you, you came out, you went onto this road, you got on the highway, or however it went. Yes. Uh, how you, when you go home or wherever you're going, let's say you're going to a shopping center. Let's say you say you're going to buy some soap, I don't know, uh, some coffee. In your mind, you'll have a geographical memory for how to get there. Yeah. Now, he was, as I said, a medical practitioner that did house calls. And he did house calls for many years. So every time he went to a patient, that geographical memory was imprinted. But he lost it okay. at about 76, 77. He, he, he got lost. He went for a walk and he got lost uh, for about two, two, three hours. Um, and it was very scary. And then he couldn't drive anymore. Because there were some signals before. And I, I, I've seen it other family members. And in fact, for six months, I looked after the female, called the female ward at Stirkfontein. And these were all elderly ladies with, um, with dementia. And I, I, I think that maybe my, my underlying fear is in a old age getting dementia. Yes. It's a horrendous, it's a horrendous uh, disease yeah. to lose memory. Because I think, who are we without memory? Yeah. And I think that's also accelerated my search to what are the lifestyles? What can one do besides medicine that can keep your brain optimal until death? I mean, we're all going to die. But my concern is to die poorly, to be looked after for 10 years or five years and, and um, not quite know what's going on um, and I saw some tragic sights once was a, a man um, 
he 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 was well, but he was six. He had been married for sixty years, but from about forty-five years of marriage, his wife started to have memory problems, and at at sixty, she she didn't know who he was. Um, and uh, I said, there must be some way that we can reduce this. And and there's there's lots of research on this. Um, yeah. <clears throat> The one one of the exciting areas is is the food we eat. Um, foods that are pro-inflammatory, which really comes down to, does it boost the insulin response? Yes. And um, and most processed sugars do that. So it's not just the the sugar levels, so-called diabetes. It's the insulin effect that causes inflammation throughout the body, yeah. especially the blood vessels. Um, the role of exercise, the role, um, the role of relationships, and perhaps just just to round this off, where I am is I'm looking at Japanese society who live the longest and uh, in the world on average. There's many parts of Japan I would not like to uh, would not like to work in the corporate world, but especially in rural Japan, I think um, they can teach us a lot. And these people, I mean, there's about twenty, I think twenty twenty five thousand of Japanese who are close to a hundred or, or, and they they still wow. live at home. Yes, and um, a central feature could be ikigai. I. K I G A I. It's a Japanese word for purpose. That many of these people that live long, relatively, have a purpose. Yes. Now, how do you measure <laughs> on brain scan, blood level, whatever, on EEG brain waves purpose? But it could be the the major d differential. I'm not saying the only one, but if you wake up in the morning and you've got purpose. Nick, if you're a podcast guy, you're going, you're going to interview Jonathan Mock, you're going to interview whoever, you know from most of your podcasts that they're interesting. You're meeting new people. And, and also you're going to edit and you're going to distribute it. And you never know who you're going to affect. There might be, from my experience on television and on, on the press, there might be just one person whose life you save. Because Jonathan Mock spoke about, or one of your other people spoke about, or, or someone changed their direction yes. in their in their lives because of a podcast, for example. So, if you wake up in the morning now and you're going to do a podcast, and you really enjoy it, that's going to have a different soup, a different recipe of chemicals in your brain. Simplistically put, using that metaphor, yes. as opposed to uh, getting up in the morning and uh, you have to take a couple of taxis here, you have to take taxis back. Um, the work you don't, you almost hate, your boss is terrible, but you need the paycheck. Yes. We can see in COVID-19, the figures, um, as we speak today, let's say there's 200,000 Americans who are symptomatic. I'm not, they are probably close to a million or more than a million that are positive. Yes. But let's say symptomatic, they've got coffin wheezes and they can't go to work. But you've got 20 million who have lost their jobs. Now that's a fact of about 100. Yeah, yeah. 200,000 into 2 million. So, so many people are losing their jobs relative to how many people are getting symptoms yes. of COVID. So the, the, a lot of people are, are working because there's a paycheck. I don't know how we're going to change it. But if you can get a paycheck, if the world pays for you, pays you for what you love doing and gives you purpose and meaning, um, that has a profound effect on health. And this is another area that I'm researching probably my third age I'm, I'm a grandfather now and um, in my early 60s that of how do you help people find their purpose what are the questions to ask how can you kind of focus in on that 
I don't think you can find your purpose in, in one minute. It, it does develop and um, and might take time in the right circumstance, a bit of luck. But I, I do think if you're motiva motivated by purpose, especially in work, uh, that has a profound effect on health. I've seen a lot of people throw around lately this quote. I think it was originally Viktor Frankl who said, or maybe it was even Dostoevsky or someone who said, uh, if the why is big enough, then the how will happen. Uh, there's a third person who I know it comes from, Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche, sorry, it I was said Nietzsche. Dostoevsky, it was Nietzsche, yeah. my bad, sorry. No, no, no. Uh, uh, Nietzsche, interesting man. He was an absolute genius, but he went crazy. Yes. Uh, so my good wife, her, her sense of humor, said he was brilliant because he was crazy when he was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if you read his stuff, um, uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, it, it's difficult. And there is an argument that he was a, it was the precursor to Sigmund Freud, that he yes. had a profound knowledge of how the inner mind worked. But you're correct, is if you have a why, then anyhow is possible. Yeah. And coming uh, specifically um, out of the Holocaust literature, you mentioned Viktor Frankl, yes. and now Edith Eager, who wrote a bestseller at 90. Wow. She was left to dead. Um, she, she was probably moments from death when the Americans liberated Auschwitz. And um, she wrote this book at 90. Uh, it's called The Choice. The Choice. The Choice. And Viktor Frankl's is The Will to Meaning yeah. and uh, a couple of others. And he brought this logo therapy. Yes. But that is the meaning is your why. Yes. And um, this was never taught to me at, at medical school. Because we, we treat problems. And maybe in a few generations' time, the whole classification of psychiatry will be changed. Or I'm not quite sure exactly how. But I think the DSM-5, for example, has played its role in research. And maybe it just there's vested interest. The American Psychiatric Association makes millions of dollars yes. tens on this. Um, you know, but the the truth is not that it is in the direction. Yes, yeah. Um, but I think once we can access the like at a stem cell level, yeah, then we can, I think, relieve a lot of suffering. Um, because a lot of suffering is actually here. Yeah, it's about thinking. Yes. <laughs> Whereas meditation. And it's becoming a, a word that's losing its it's really focused attention which is awareness and awareness is the opposite of attention yeah in, in a sense awareness is just what is not thinking about it yeah and a lot of people can't really sleep at night because they don't know how not to think so they're trying to think tomorrow how is my boss going to deal with this my, my view is for an hour or two before you go to sleep you stop thinking about tomorrow and more aware from bathing to reading light stuff to light conversation and tomorrow and this has been a, a massive turnaround for me personally yes it's just to see how things unfold i've got my structure of course i've got my routines very much like a podcast i can't oh i must say this i must say that it's just let it unfold yes you did send me for example some questions to give routine that's fine. But I think that's for life. But to allow life to just unfold moment to moment. And what, what John Kabat Zinn would say, the bloom of the present moment. Yes. You got that from Henry David Thoreau, Walden Pond. That is just magnificent. And I've got this place now at Huddle Park, just a few minutes away. I've got actually three sites there that they've given me that I've developed. One's in the forest forest therapy one's a sitting area and another one's by the lake okay and uh, it's called mindfulness in the park and th this is this is all an attempt it's grassroots an attempt to bring in other non-medication ways of doing it, or thinking because i i do believe that medication especially in the west has become a form of lifestyle yeah it's a lifestyle now 
There's nothing wrong in taking medicine. It's a lifestyle. It's almost if you're not on medication, there's something, <laughs> there's something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, a, that's paradoxical. But, um, so, and it's easy to take a tablet. You just take your tablet and you let it do the work. But it's much more fun and you can really expand your mind, as it were, and your experience of life, which gives a much more of a richness and a breath by becoming more aware. Yeah. So we've we've touched on a whole bunch of things right now that I would love to get into. We've touched on COVID-19, stress, medication. So let's just break that up at first. And let's if I can ask you to, to speak on COVID-19, one of the things I'd really want to cover is what is it doing to our people on a mental level? We we've so caught up in the in the symptoms of what is COVID nineteen? Do I have it or not? Why are some people asymptomatic? But what is the the pandemic as a whole? Um, if you if you look at the world and the country as a whole, and then individually on a psychological level, what is COVID nineteen doing to us? I haven't a clue, <laughs> except <laughs> except to say this: that if we look at all trauma that occurs. Let's take the wolf uh, 9-11. Look at trauma in South Africa's past. Apartheid. You tend to get a bell-shaped curve in response. This, I, I love looking at life questions through a bell-shaped curve one way. And that you'll get... 15 to 20% of people that develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. You'll get about 65 to 70% of people who, after a few months, will return to normal. And then you get about 8 to 10% who get post-traumatic growth, PTG, who actually grow from the trauma. Okay. So when I say I haven't a clue, means really I don't know where the individual is on that normal distribution curve. Okay. So my guess would be that 15, 20% of people <clears throat> are going to come apart. Specifically, relationships, intimate relationships in the home where they are socially isolated and there's fractures in the relationship. Domestic, <coughs> excuse me, domestic violence is is on the is is on the up. Marital therapists are doing a lot more work, but there is a ten percent who are growing, and I would say I myself personally, when I woke up on I think twenty fifth of March in Johannesburg, first day of shutdown, I never as I woke up I said. This is a challenge. And one of the challenges I took on was to understand COVID-19. And I watched lots of podcasts. I read the best journals and went to get a grip of it. It's still unfolding. But also what I did was, I didn't go out of my house for about 35 days. I, I, I Zoomed most of my patients. Yes. I looked around the house. We've got three little gardens going now. We've got a private like meditation with birds to the garden. Um, my room, I started to look at my library and I said, you know, you've got lots of interesting books in this. Started to read again. Yes. And also uh, with YouTube meditations and, and watching podcasts uh, and finding who my favorite are. So I've structured my day. Into, my wife has been working, she's quite senior at the university, every day from home. What a blessing in a way that we don't you know, we see each other through the day and we might have breakfast or, or supper together and the weekends more time together. Our close, our children, our granddaughters are, are regular visitors. So our important relationships have become deeper. My relation, my marital relationship is much, much deeper. We're not distracted by all kinds of stuff. Yes. I mean, you can be distracted by... Netflix, I guess. But COVID-19 is <coughs> disrupting. Now, if we link it up to stress, yes, and look at it as a pure stress researcher, 
This is the biggest stress test, at least in the last 100 years, at every single level in almost every country, every sector, whether it's the medical sector, education, policing, political, retail, uh, telecommunications, podcasts. Um, it is it is disrupting everything. Now, when there's disruption, I think those with post-traumatic growth, maybe it's post-traumatic innovation. Yes. That there are going to be 10, 15, let's even push it up to 20% of people who see the gap, the volatility. I mean, if you look at traders who trade in shares and yes. stocks, they love volatility. That's where they make the money. Yeah. So if you can... Now, we'll probably we'll get into this. If you can just stand back from this and not get up close and get caught up in the the waves and the fears, there's opportunities. And there's also ways to change your lifestyle. I think the research is people are eating better. Not everyone, but yeah. people are eating better. People are exercising more. This This major stress of commutes to work especially for those that are lucky to work from home, uh, has been removed. Yeah. And there are people now who are saying, you know, they're getting a bit of information overload. They say you know, to their work, I'm only working for eight hours a day. These are my hours. <laughs> from 8 to 11, from 2 to 5, and 7 to 9, let's say. Yes. And the other time is they're exercising, they're taking the, uh, playing with the kids, teaching the kids and whatever. So when you talk about COVID-19, the big fear is virus. I think it's in our genes because since recorded history, human beings have suffered from pandemics. Yes. I mean, the Bible is full of plagues. Yes. The Black Plague. That you've, this, is, this is because we globalized, it's transported by airplanes and truck drivers going through Africa or whatever. But if we hold the negative and do the basic self-isolate, wash our hands, wear a mask in public and whatever, um, and also know that the numbers are relatively low, relatively. Yeah. I mean, the media have these scorecards every day. They're just playing into people's fears. But... What's interesting, Nick, is I started to do some home videos in, in January, February, and I'm embarrassed to say that when COVID-19 started in China, I said, this is a small thing. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, not, but I didn't understand it. No. But I didn't realize now how disruptive it's been. But there's always positive. And if you look at the deaths, unfortunately, the deaths are mainly in the elderly who are immunocompromised, who would have died, and I, I'm trying to say this compassionately, yes. who would have died if there was no treatment for diabetes or high blood pressure. And many of them are on stents or have had heart, you know, heart problems or, 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 men, or, or pneumonias or, or whatever, and um, they would have died. Um, you know, uh, if we look, oh, in that original, you know, video I took of myself, yes. I compared it to malaria. And I've been following the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on infectious diseases. And um, they say, I don't know if it's their research or they, they, speaking about other people's research, but about 250,000 people in Africa die a year from malaria. 250,000? Thousands. Okay. Between 30 and 40 million people have died from HIV AIDS. Now, if you, are, <laughs> if you ask me the way to have stopped HIV AIDS in the 1980s, because it's passed by fluids, mainly sexual activity, is isolate people. <laughs> yeah. You know? <laughs> And then maybe we'll get rid of that. But we don't hear that. <clears throat> and perhaps because it's, it's, it's airborne yeah. and it's touch. And I understand that fear that you don't know who that person with a call has a mist 
it's actually a quite an interesting idea if you're within two meters of someone yes. in an enclosed place the air particles that's probably the main way or they they touch something and then they spread it that way yes but just to get back to your point is this COVID 19 uh, also in terms of research there's going to be decades of research yeah on what COVID 19 has done all i can say is with my mindset that i've been which is a growth mindset uh, an effort, put in effort, it's a challenge, and, um, and and there's always a positive part of it. I think we're going to get about 10, 15% of people who are going to really do well. I mean, you, you, you look at some companies in the world, the tech companies, um, the, the internet companies are doing extremely well yeah. because they're providing a, human beings have to talk to each other. Yeah. But I do th think the liquor industry, <laughs> um, leisure, airlines, people are going to have FOGO. You know, what's it? It's FOMO. Yes. Fear of missing out. Now it's fear out. of going out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. FOGO. I call it FOGO. It's not my term. I picked it up somewhere. Fear of going out. But it's going to shift to, there's going to be shifts in, in, in many many systems i i've been one arguing for homeschooling um and i think that homeschooling is a way to go um not in the old way of doing it with the, the parents but you there's one school here a local school that's not opening for the third term because the kids are getting everything now on on um internet on the internet and zoom yeah and the kids go out in the afternoon and they go running or playing tennis or, or whatever it might be. Um, but I do think that, imagine schools now where you had the best maths teacher in South Africa teaching a million kids. Yeah. Because that's what COVID has done. It's got this technology. Imagine the best math teacher teaching a million kids. Or ten thousand or a hundred thousand through into the classroom. Uh, the teachers are, there's going to be disruption of teachers, but the poor teachers are going to be you know, if you don't if you don't up your game. Yeah. And um it's just how the social so what I don't can't predict is what's going to happen to people socially. Because that's one thing I miss is my mates I can talk to or go have dinner with or meet at a restaurant. And yes, I've got so many decades of that. But what are you about young people? Are they going to become more, you know, um, self-orientated and whatever? But um, on the other hand, there are probably about 20, 25 percent of kids who are not suited for our school systems, which is really it's like a, the manufacturing from the the industrial revolution you know they factory schools many schools are factories if you look yes they've got you know they've got uniforms and bells and and discipline and you know the academic st standards you know if a product comes out of a toyota let's say yes they check 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 so now you got check your you got your maths <laughs> yeah okay. and, and so on and um i think it's quite unnatural the fourth industrial revolution might be just being forced upon us. I think the worlds of artificial intelligence, robotics, autonomous vehicles, um, so many other things, um, is uh, online currencies, with, uh, not so much Bitcoin, but um, a universal currency, uh, space exploration. I mean, just follow Elon Musk. And, yes. Uh, yeah. And you'll see, I mean, he's quite, a, he's far ahead. But I do think autonomous vehicles is going to have a profound effect on transport where you can, not just, it's like an Uber. Yeah. I Uber a lot. And um, in three minutes, you're going to get a, a vehicle that's with no driver. Yes. That's it's got all the information. And uh, so I think this, uh, this COVID-19, yes, there is the medical effects, there is the fears. But mindfulness, and what I'm trying to get is, is, is you stand back from it. Yeah. And what you can control, you control. I can't control 
mask wearing in Arizona, New York, uh, or New York. But what I can do is I can put on my own mask. Or if I see my wife or my children or my grandchildren, I say, oh, your mask. That I can influence. And what I've learned over 30 years is really the only thing we can control is our response. And this comes back to Viktor Frankl's yes. greatest idea that between every situation and response to it, there's a space. It's got a situation, response, space. And the choice lies in the space. Lies in that space. Yeah. That's what I'm really, really interested in. How can you maximize your response in any situation? And that's where you have to, it's not just thinking, you have to be aware. Aware of what's out there and aware how you're responding. Your emotions, your thoughts, your con th uh, possible consequences of doing things. I feel there's a lot of fear, as you were saying, driven by the media um, because the focus is on deaths and uh, infection and the, and the numbers and things. And one thing I was told recently is that all fear comes from an inherent fear of death. And I'm sure you can touch on that, but is that part of why we are so so affected during COVID-19 is just because it's that fear of death that's being driven by everything we see and everything we, we are given by the media? Yeah. The media know how to push the fear button. Dostoevsky, who you mentioned, and others, their works are very dark. Yes. <laughs> and a lot of them is around existential philosophy yeah. um, about what's the meaning of life. We're all going to die. And that, if you're a contemplative kind of person like I am, I think I I've at least got one chromosome. <laughs> I've always contemplated. I've always walked out in nature by myself. Yes. Is what's this? We born, we live, we die. Nelson Mandela was born, lives, dies. Steve Jobs, born, lives, dies. We're all going to die. We just don't know when and how. And then what? And of course, there are the great religions that, just to put it from this angle, that really, and a lot of secular people and atheists, they, they use this argument, but, but I think it's important to put on the record at least, that it's a way to temper anxiety. That when mom and dad goes, dies, they go to heaven. And if dad dies and, and afterwards mom dies 10 years later, well, mom's going to meet dad. Yes. And I always like to say, you know, what what what, what happens if a man of 25 mar marries a beautiful woman of 22 and they have the most beautiful marriage? But unfortunately, at 40, she dies in a car accident. Dad's devastated, but after five years, he meets another woman, falls in love, and has 30 years marriage and dies. Yeah. <laughs> now, when he goes to heaven, which, which wife's can <laughs> get it? Yeah. I mean, uh, that's a bit of a fun, but... We have in our brain, and this is maybe where the psychiatry is so interesting, is we have something called the amygdala. Yes. And the emotional limbic, which is the fear, like sentinel. Mm. Evolutionary biologists say we have to have it because, I mean, if you, I've got a bird boss. You must see these birds, how they look at other birds. Yeah. Safety. Because they're bullies. Yeah. There's a whole hierarchical system, especially pigeons come in, they like, like push everyone away. But you can see there's, there's a hierarchy, and they're looking out for danger. And so our brains have this thing. I mean, if I'm walking in the street, I, you know, it's late at night and I hear a noise, well, I, I need a fear response. We do need fear response. Yes. You know, if I, I don't know, got an exam coming up and I don't study for it, well, there's a fear that if I fail it, then my whole career is gone. So in many, we need this fear and anxiety. But the media, uh, specifically, but there's also people... I, I've stopped going to certain family uh, friends in a way or restricted because they only talk about fear at the dinner table. Yes. And the more you agree with them, 
the more they like it. And if I try to stop them, they actually almost get angry. Yeah. Because their whole narrative, now this is a big one, their whole narrative is about the past or the future. So anxiety is about future, what will happen. What If I don't wear my mask or I get infected, then my mind starts to imagine my thinking, what am I seeing in the newspapers? I'm just seeing these cops and these PPEs and these doctors and the ICUs and the ventilators and, and, yes. and everything goes with it. So you build up in your mind a whole long, narr big narrative. I think Mark Twain said he's lived through many disasters that never happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you, get, you get that. Yes. People build up. all, the, And all it does, it blocks, call it the awareness, real estate of what's beautiful. You know, um, if I can just show you. Yeah. I told you this. This is in my garden. I, is, if you just look to this, the, the magnificence, the miracle yes. of, of that, the beauty of it. Yeah. Instead of getting caught up in things that aren't probably going to happen. Yes. And then the other side of it is, taking up the other part of the cortical real estate of awareness, is your past. What was, and all your regrets, and I should have, and I could have, and whatever. Whereas if you just, in, in the present, I mean, I don't think you can capture the moment because this moment moves to that moment. But what I like to say it almost at the end of every day is, was that a good day? Was that a meaningful day? Even if things didn't turn out that I thought should have turned out. Yes. And then, yeah, there was. there's a lot of interesting, meaningful moments. And that, I think, drops a lot of this anxiety and depression Together with its derivative, if I may say, which is addiction, which is sleep disorders, which is eating disorders, I mean, I mean obesity. Yes. Because a lot of people eat sugar to change the way they feel. But all that energy that's not being used, calories is converted into fat. Yes. And that becomes, and fat now is, is pro-inflammatory. Yeah. That's why a lot of people with, who are the most very overweight, uh, they succumb that much easier because the immune system is disturbed. Yeah. So we, we, we're asking big questions now is, is depression, anxiety, nicotine, and alcohol. So here in this country, in South Africa, another experiment, banning cigarettes. Yes, there is the black economy and it's being sold, and like any drug, cannabis, cocaine, I worked with addicts for 20 years, and they've explained the economics. They should get the MBAs, <laughs> the honorary <laughs> MBAs, I mean, some of them. Yeah. But, boy, if you understand how the the uh, the illegal drug market works worldwide, it is a phenomenal understanding of economic uh, economics. Yeah. Uh, from manufacturer to supplier to distributor to... to um, understanding demand and supply and getting the price right and um, providing that service. And uh, and now we've got alcohol. But I think smoking is very difficult to say. Can we stop smoking now for, for let's say, we, we drop smoking by 20%, let's say. Is there 20% healthier lungs? That is much more difficult than alcohol. Yes. That was shown clearly that from the day of lockdown, until the day they lifted the restrictions, that alcohol-related deaths, or, uh, alcohol, yeah, related deaths plus alcohol-related casualties, yes, were significantly down. Yeah, thirty percent of beds, for example, at hospitals like Barra. I'm not saying specific, but I know some friends who work in trauma units, and they said it was dead quiet. Yeah, on the weekends because alcohol causes aggression and pedestrians that are drunk and they get knocked down by cars and yeah. drunk drivers and and people get drunk at home and, and violence is there and so here you have something quite interesting is that you pulled out alcohol with, and and that's a significant effect of decreasing the hospital's essential services which could be a could be 
a bigger effect than keeping people out of work. Yeah. I mean, you still need the self-isolation, the mask. But stopping drinking might, have, might turn out to be the number one factor in preventing the overload yes. of health systems or their really illness systems, hospital systems. Yeah. yeah. You touched on anxiety and depression. Now, and we're going to change gears a little bit here, sure. but I'd like to get into the the medication side of, of treating things like anxiety and, and depression because there has been maybe in the past more so this traditional view of psychiatrists and, and medical doctors of treating the symptoms with medication and then sending their patient on their way. Mm. But there's without a doubt a bigger influence maybe from the Eastern perspectives on um, on how the mind works and, and the power of meditation and mindfulness. Has there been a shift in, in the way we we treat the most common mental illnesses such as anxiety and depression? And um, should there be a bigger shift away from medication or am I not in the right space there? Yeah. Um, as I said, anxiety is about the future and depression is about the past in general terms. Yes. But gives rise to a subjective feeling that can develop its derivatives, I like using that word, of, of changing biological systems such as sleep, libido, appetite, energy, motivation. So I would say there are the extremes of anxiety and depression that medication is wonderful and, and, and powerful and important. Yes. Because people that live with uncontrolled panic attacks and and generalized anxiety, they become they become paralyzed. Depression is a hell. I'm talking about deep, deep depression, especially with a genetic component. There's there's no doubt about that. Yeah. But that's ten percent. Okay. Then you've got on the other side maybe ten or twenty percent, my favorite kind of patients who are depressed, anxious, but say, you know, I want to work through this. Let's talk about it. Teach me lifestyles. But you've got like 50% worried well. Worried well. And um, in, in terms of resilience, which is your ability to bounce back, yes. which was my big theme at teaching at a hospital eight and a half years, you needed a bit of an inoculation. We, we, we want a vaccine for COVID-19. Yeah. But we also need a vaccine for dealing with life. Yeah. And in the whole trauma story, there's a differentiation between being a victim and victimhood. And being a victim recognized, yes, I was a victim. I had COVID-19, I survived, I was raped, I was, I was bullied, I was this, whatever. But it doesn't serve your cause because that becomes your narrative. You can't let go of the past. And there are political, there are social, there are family, there's personal, where people, a minority, almost like get a perverse sense of well-being by being a victim. Yes. Victimhood. There's an addiction to it in a way. Yeah. The, if you look at the Holocaust literature, those people who came out from the most horrendous, where they lost everything. They saw the worst. The ones that did well, did, as Jonathan Sachs wrote in More Morality, they first secured the future, then they redeemed their past. Okay. And first, get yourself going, build your family, get your income going. Go, don't don't try out thinking your past, which is almost anti-Freudian type yes. of thing. But I'm, that makes sense. So when we call, when we talk about medication. There are so many powers. It's, it's like fast foods. There's no ways that a few people are going to stop the juggernaut of fast food industries, of big food. But you can make a choice. You and I can make a choice on what foods we can eat. Yes. And basically, the less they've been processed, the better, in a sense. The same thing comes with anxiety and depression. There's big pharma. There's big alcohol. There's big food, and especially big pharma. 
These are Pfizer and AstraZeneca and all of these are massive companies that have a whole industry with people, reps and doctors and all part of it who are being rewarded. If a doctor, a psychiatrist, a general practitioner writes a script, gets paid for that. Yeah. You know, and uh, so it's complicated. But if I'm talking to the person who's listening, I, I really believe that we are moral agents and we can choose on how we want to live our lives, how we ought to live our lives. <clears throat> I mean, I, there, there were cases where there was a sudden death and um, there was a funeral and GPs would give tranquilizers. I mean, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. Yes, if that person is severely, had major breakdowns, you maybe up the dose. But to feel the pain of death and the finality, and that's one of the unfortunate things of COVID-19, is that funerals are being restricted. Yes. Visiting the survivors, the yes. mourners, has been, that's going to be interesting to see how that pans out in later years. But uh, when we talk about anxiety, depression, it's... Um, we're not applying ph philosophy to it. We're not applying um, many other things except these are the symptoms. If you've got the symptoms, here's the tablet. Come back in two weeks. Okay, doc, I feel better. But what you've really done is just changed how the neurons transmit to each other. Okay. You haven't changed what might be called your multiple intelligences. You haven't reflected on what's important what's your purpose in life you've blocked it that's a danger that's a danger um, and so we're getting all these medicalized people for issues of life i mean there was a a strong strong outburst when they the dsm-5 wanted to they did that that shyness is now social anxiety disorder i mean that's People are shy. Thirty percent of people are introvert. Yeah. But why give a medicine? And this is coming back to this: medicine is a lifestyle, and it's very different, difficult to change a lifestyle. So I think let's just sum up this anxiety, depression, and be clear yes. that there are certain people who need it. And I've got patients of thirty years who are on low dose. And we've tried to, and when it comes, it comes back, that, yeah. like diabetes. You know, you, if you have to be on insulin, you have to be on insulin. Yes. But as some people have shown with type 2 diabetes, by radically changing your lifestyle, the food you eat, the exercise you do, and so forth, you can actually reverse type 2 diabetes. I don't think type 1. Yeah. That's just a bit. So... Yeah, the question really becomes is what motivates people and are people prepared to stick with it? Yes. Are they prepared to pay the price? And what I love about this whole meditation, mindfulness, mind-body kind of thing is you don't have to wait for tomorrow. You can get your immediate effect now. Yeah. And the East, when you mention the East, the West don't like it for I'm talking about the West. I'm talking about Western, ac yes. many academics. Not so much the, some of the Americans or some of their top young scientists went across to the East in the 60s, 70s, and they brought back meditation. Yes. So it's more integrated. Mindfulness meditation, John kabat is in about 1,500 medical centers around the world. Okay. Phenomenal. There are millions of people who are being trained in it and are training. But the East, especially the Buddhist, in it, in it, I think it's got problems on the, at the more social, political, mm -hmm. but where their greatest contribution, the science of mind, that when you meditate, you can become aware that the mind's got a mind of its own, that it just wanders off. You know, and, and just a thought pops in, and another thought pops in, and then that feeling passes through. But you can also, your mind can teach you to focus and what Kabat-Zinn says, which I really like, that's the formal practice of meditation. Um, 
is the tuning up. When you, life is your curriculum. So whatever comes up in life, that's what your curriculum is. Oh, yes. But you need the skills that you can switch. And almost unconsciously, you can say, you're saying to yourself unconsciously, I'm being fully aware right now. So, you know, this anxiety, depression is, is a big story. And, um, and if you talk about what, what social media is doing, the results are, especially amongst teenagers, there's less promiscuity and there's less drugs. But there's more depression. There's more self-esteem issues. Yes. There's more anxiety. Because people relate to, you know, on their phones. Yeah. But they're not going out there, so they, the promiscuity is down, the drugs are down. And that low self-esteem, that I'm not good enough, I'm not beautiful enough, the Instagram, my whole prof profile of trying to be perfect, I think is damaging part of our brains that have developed over millions of years to, to deal with adversity. Yes. And the snowflake. And now we have cancel cultures and, you know, and political <laughs> erect. And, and I think there are issues. But because I don't like what you say, I'm going to cancel you. Yes. That's wrong. I don't like what you say. Okay, I'll accept that. But I'm going to say why you shouldn't. Or let's yes. have a discussion. Let's have the That's discussion. being lost. That's being lost. And um, I don't know what the, the outcome of that's going to be. Yeah. It's very much a new thing. So the people affected by it are, are younger generations. So we don't know how that plays out when they become leaders of families and, and parents and so forth. Um, and that leads me to our next question is, if we look at um, self-esteem and things, I like this uh, idea that what we give people is the, if we, are, if we are a house, what we give people is the front rooms. We just show them the entrance hallway on social media, but there's so many rooms in the back that we're not allowing people to see. And we also ourselves are refusing to look within to those back rooms we're trying to make this entrance all so beautiful um how does that play into into our mind or what do, what does that do to us by avoiding what's maybe let's let's use the the yin yang symbol you know we we're avoiding the darker side of of our being and and the low self-esteem and the the trauma or whatever it is that we're sitting with mm, mm. Yeah, I I um I can't predict, and um, but if you go, Ray Dalio, another favorite author, um, wrote Principles, and um, he he's a, he, he's one of the top hedge fund managers in the world, but he's got a very interesting way of running his company. But he's now written a book on, or writing a book on, five hundred years or thousand years of economic history and looking how empires have come and gone. And the four that is interested in is the Dutch, the British, the Americans, and the Chinese. And linking up to what was the reserve currency. So the reserve currency is dollars. 60% of transactions will done dollars in dollars. And uh, But it looks at about eight different factors, education, um, trade, um, and other things. And remarkable over hundreds of years, you see, China, about 500 years ago, was an empire, and then it dropped. And then the Dutch came along, and they could build boats. Okay. And the Dutch each is kind of South Africa. And um, and from there, of course, Portugal and other European countries uh, started their colonies and whatever. And then from about 45, uh, the British, the Victorian era, the, the British uh, manufacturing. And uh, the sun never sets on the British Empire, which means that there's always a country in the British Empire that the sun is, is shining. Yes. And they started to drop uh, uh, in the early 20s or so. But America, after the Second World War, 1945, they, that the dollar became the reserve currency. But if you look at China now, you see, we see the United States doing this, and you see China doing that and 
if you look at the tensions, and one of my hobbies is watching geopolitical. <laughs> Somewhere in Johannesburg, you're watching these big powers playing out. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's no doubt that, that China's on the ascendancy and the West, the West is worried. The West is really worried as empire, uh, you know, especially the United States. You can see these trade wars and, 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 and China's flexing its muscles and now TikTok and Huey yes. and uh, all, all of these um, tensions is just, they're squaring up for a big fight. It seems like there's the economic, the history is economic that becomes at times um, hot wars yes. where they shoot. Now, whether that whether it's going to be shooting or it's going to be cyber warfare or different types of war, then why I'm saying that is I'd, the youth, the, the teenagers, they become young adults. They, be, go, they become 30s and 40s and 50s. And if you look at the 1960s, that was the hippie culture. Yeah. And the parents and society was very worried what, what happened in the 1960s. Yeah. Um, but it seems like it turned out okay in, in a broad sense. <laughs> yes, yeah. It turned out, you know, the sexual revolution. But still today you're having, a lot of those, they, they got married and, you know, uh, they, what Zorba the Greek, uh, talk, you know, he lives the full catastrophe. You know, he dances to the full catastrophe of you've got a spouse and you've got a children you're educating and you've got a bond to pay. Yeah. And who knows that it might be just... You know, when they mature, when they let's say their genes or come through in the thirties, forties, they might be better. There's a lot of millennials who are twenty five, thirty who are wonderful people and you know, their causes are, are great. And and what I'm hearing about TikTok yes, there's the bad. There's always the bad. But they saying this is the only way we can use our political. It's not through the old systems of voting every four years and yes. it's all kind of fixed then. I mean, if you look at Russia, I mean, Putin can stay there till 2036. Yeah. And uh, and just look at how the American uh, uh, political system. So there's always the good. Yeah. There's always the bad. But maybe, maybe the intractable world problems will be solved by the teenagers because they can activate very quickly. I mean, when you're talking about, we're talking about climate change, we're talking about gross economic inequality in the world. We're talking about racism, ageism, sexism, all of this. The Me Too movement, Harvey Weinstein was brought down, boy, by a hashtag. Yes. And not only him. Uh, whereas 20 years ago, these women were just paid off or lived horrible lives yeah. going forward. So once again, like with COVID-19, I don't think we should slam social media. I mean, some of them is, although, although having said that, I heard that the founders of these social media sites, they got together. I don't know if it's a legend, whatever, yeah. but they got together and many have said, if they knew where it would be today, they wouldn't have done it. They that. wouldn't have done it. And, yeah. um, but once again, we moral agents, we individually must choose. So I think like WhatsApp, WhatsApp's brilliant for me because I do all my bookings and those are all my, my calls to my children and, and there's video. But I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on Facebook, personally. Yes. I don't need to be because I just find you just get caught up in, oh, yeah. in these fights and arguments and I can't control that. My stress levels go up. Yes. But... Um, WhatsApp, email, getting the internet searches, podcasts, YouTube uh, are really, really good. I think regulation will come in, but just like alcohol, alcohol can be fantastic. If you have a glass of red wine or whiskey, it can be a wonderful, I don't know about cigarettes, but yeah. but, um, but when used to excess causes violence and lots of things. Yeah. I want to just get back to the um, when we spoke on the Eastern philosophies. Have you seen a, a shift away from religion towards more spirituality approach? I, I can't say myself. I, 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 in my media environment, I think South Africans, by and large, are not into Eastern yes. stuff. Uh, 
to make a joke of the enterprise. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think we have wonderful weather here, uh, which uh, is quite interesting. Um, South Africa's, I'm, I'm talking very generally, and, yes. and I'm looking at mindfulness, how, how I've battled personally to bring it into Johannesburg. Um, I'm not talking about Johannesburg, just getting, but South Africa, let's say it's 90% black, let's say. Uh, this is a general thing. General, yeah. But many of the black people are deeply religious. Yes. Deeply religious. Um, Indians, I'm just Indians, there's little Muslims, Hindus, and there's a lot of Christians. Um, I wouldn't say that they're overly religious, but there seems to be like a spiritual, now we enter into difficult terms, uh, soul. Yeah. that needs to be fed. Now, that could be just an emotion that we need to feel connected, that gives meaning. It's very consciousness. The big problem for me is consciousness in the soul. Yeah. <laughs> the, the more atheist science say there's no soul, the, but everyone agrees there's a consciousness. <laughs> the, but the soul, I mean, there are so many people who find things sacred, mm. a sacredness to whatever. To relationships, uh, there's some like food, prayer. Um, what seems to be more in the more advanced West, and we talk about Britain and um, United States, and the United States is also quite a religious country, but yeah. Buddhism through through meditation and and yoga, which is Hindi mainly, uh, is big and. What seems to be is that there is overall in human beings a need for spirituality that makes us different, that gives us meaning, gives us purpose. I don't think a dog or a cow or even a very cl clever chimpanzee thinks yeah. about meaning. Yes. But religion in its structured form is weakening. Because a lot of the, the younger people are saying, we don't need to go to a church or a synagogue or a temple or even a mosque um, and, and sit there and, and not quite know what's going on. And then we find faults with our leaders and whatever. Mm -hmm. But there is a need for spiritual food. And that's more, okay, I'll do my yoga or my tai chi or go for a run, or go for a walk in nature, or take up climate change. That gives me meaning. That's spiritual. In a way. It sounds like a bit of a connection. Yeah. So, you know, perhaps the atheists would say that religion has played its role. You know, it's yeah. almost like post religion I don't think so. I think religion uh, um, is there. It's it's not just religion. There's a big social element of being connected with the people that think the same. That gives also maybe on the amygdala yeah. decreases the anxiety. So, with you know, there's always been those groups from the West. They've gone to Nepal and India and in search of meaning and purpose they didn't want to live like their parents which is you know yeah, yeah. 85 job a job for life and you know you're just selling your time um but spiritual people come through in different ways i, I know some of my colleagues who had students with me at medical school are tops in the fields in hypertension and other areas and uh, they're not religious but they're religious in a sense that <laughs> that field they're in They'll give their lives for. Yeah. They've given their lives for. Yeah. So once again is with awareness and where I'm going as a psychiatrist, if you get you have to get below the system and almost like the core stem cell. What drives religiosity? What drives what's the need? Yes. And um I think genetics there there's a role to play there. And uh, I want to say it's evolutionary, Darwinian, altruism, or whatever it might be. There, there, there's something there that leads to another interesting idea called epigenetics. Yes. And epigenetics is the ability of your lifestyle, 
appear to change dial up or dial down various genes, about five, six hundred genes. It's a big thing in genetics yes. now. Which comes back to this what does meditation, walks in nature, the foods you eat, the amount that you sleep, big one, eh? uh, the quality of your sleep, your relationships, the, the, the trusting relationships. The intimacy of relationships. Um, somebody who can listen to you. Um, what is it? Yeah, the exercise you do. You know, what does that do to genetic dialing up or dialing down? And I found this a fascinating 500, maybe a thousand genes now that can affect your blood pressure or, or, or your inflammation. Or, yeah. or even the very interesting one is called. Telomeres. Yes. You're aware of telomeres. And the, 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 end, the end parts of the of chromosomes. The chromosome, yeah. Involved in cell division. Yes. So as you age, they get shorter and yeah. shorter. So it stops cell division. So it's been shown in some studies that meditation increases the enzyme telomerase that keeps the telomeres longer. Oh, yes. So one way to see it's like a, a shoelace, you know, that like plastic yeah, at the end. The end yeah. yeah. So. That, that to me is fascinating. Um, what they also showed in meditation, by the way, is in elderly, older people, their, their prefrontal cortex, where we think, which controls our emotions and our breath, actually strengthens with meditation. So um, if we just get trying to put this all together is um, what does spirituality and purpose and maybe at the core of spirituality is purpose, because religions give you purpose. Yes. So classic monotheism, there's a God that created the world, and everyone's created in the image of God. That, that is powerful. Abraham comes along, <laughs> who set up all the three big ones, in a way, and basically said, in a way, we co-creators with God. In other words, God created the world, and with God's help, we can Yes. Bring some solution to the world, make the world a better place. Now, that gives tremendous sense of purpose. Yeah. And if you're amongst people who believe that deeply and you pray and you have festivals and you have written scriptures, um, oh, this gives me meaning. The problem is when the religion becomes like a political thing and loses its meaning and becomes power place. Yeah. And abuse, as the Catholic Church, for example, has shown. The priests that, not all of them, a minority have yes. abused them. And so you can't, can you trust your kids or going into that system? Yeah. And and, and by the way, all, all, all of them have their, their bad eggs, but specifically the Catholic Churches, because they're so big and powerful. Yeah. And probably they've got lots of reserves so they can be sued. <laughs> yeah. I want to give you a chance just to touch because we've you've actually been touching on it all the time. But I know you work currently. You have the the FOTEO system, um, very much in with the connectedness that you spoke about, the awareness, and then also I saw on your website uh, is it called My Earth? Yes. I R T H. Okay. Okay. Yes. So FOT FOTEO F O T E O from ordinary to Extraordinary. It's a it's an acronym. Okay. And this started uh, in the beginning of the 2000s. And um, it took me actually, the, I had a whole program, eight-part series. It took me into a lot of companies. Um, but photo was said about if, that if you change your lifestyles and et cetera, then you can lead a better life. What I've realized which is one of the beauties of this meditation. That, and there's many doors to meditation. You can just find your own. There's no one yes. specific. Meditation is basically focused attention. Yeah. Your ability to pay attention to what's now on purpose without judgment. Um, and mindfulness is pure awareness. John Cabot's in pure awareness. So photo for me has the, you can lead an extraordinary life just by being present so it's really from ordinary to extraordinary moments, photiom. Okay. That's what it's about. Yeah. Um, because I realize that you don't know when you're going to die. 
you know, killed in a car accident at this moment. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so really, it's uh, how do we capture those moments? How do we make them extraordinary? And I believe that there's two, two sides to this. One is this more cognitive side, your purpose. And that is asking what you're good at. Yeah. Because Peter Drucker said, famous management consultant, he said, if you work on your weaknesses, you become average. If you work on your strengths, you can be excellent. Now, just meeting you, I think this is one of your strengths. Work on it, podcasting. Yes. Number two is what you love to do. Because you can be good at something. You can be good at surgery, but you don't love it. Yeah. You can be good at maths, but you don't enjoy it. So when you combine what you're good and love, ooh, that's that's something. The third question is, does the world need it? Okay. I think the world is in search of awareness because we've become dominated. I'm talking very generally, dominated by thinking, thinking, age of reason. Yes. That's why I find a lot of philosophy are actually very sad because they're trying to think the problem which they can't. Yes. It's there. Yeah. <laughs> You can't unthink death yes. <laughs> or suffering. So what you what you love doing, what the world needs, and will you be paid for it? Because there's a reality. We need financial. And I've seen people poor, and it's terrible. I'm talking about poverty. You, you see on the streets. I mean, it's at every, every metric, they're down. Yeah. Um, and... Interesting, at the beginning of the year, I started to l read about minimalism yes. and essentialism. And I'm just finishing a book called The Abundance of Less. Okay. So it means, what can I get by with? So why our Uber is, my one son got my wife's car, we got another car, my wife sometimes uses that. So I think that I'm not going to buy, in fact, my license has expired. Okay. because of lockdown yeah so I, it's one thing is do i really have to drive a car and for, I, this is where i work in and huddle parks about for five minutes by car by yeah. five k's sometimes i walk it i don't really need another car it's not essential for me we'll have one car yeah if we go on holiday but yeah, we don't yeah. need two cars and some people have three okay some people would just wish they had a bicycle okay it depends where you are yeah and what foods you eat? What's essential foods? You know, what, what is really essential? And um, I like this thing that, that you know, less is more. Now that comes to Project Earth, which is really looking at four areas of your life. Earth I is your income. And I put it first. I, you know, COVID-19 has struck that and there are many people who are forced to work or have to work because of the paycheck in you know in in supermarkets and, yes. and um, where there's all these people together r is relationships i-r-t-h relationships with yourself with others with a higher power depends where you are that gives stability and a lot of purpose by the way is around relationships yeah it's about educating children and um, uh, to have a beautiful, deep, meaningful relationship. In fact, after almost 34 years of marriage, I, I realized that at marriage, yes, this is the person you love, and you want, but you're actually marrying, marrying your most stable best friend. Yeah. Because throughout life, you're giving up best friends. You had a best friend at nursery school, primary school, high school, university, yeah. even your children. When they grow up, I've got all my children are married. They've moved on. They've got their best friends, their wives now, with three sons. Um, a lot of problems with relationships with self. But the paradox is that relationship with self is often improved by outward looking, helping others. Yeah. Because if you, like this whole self-esteem movement is actually false. The best thing is for kids who've got low self, go out and do something for someone else. Yes. Feel good about yourself by, by helping others. Yes, you become so, self-empowered. Yeah. Or even your hands. Make a podcast. 
draw something, flowers, uh, go work in the garden, millions of things. Go do something that's not about you. And this John Kabat-Zinn and others is the whole personal pronoun of me, mine, and I. <laughs> me, mine, and I. That's where the, the West especially has moved, is into a lot about individualism, mm. me, mine, I. It's moved from we being collaborative to I. You you have affected my dignity. <laughs> yeah. You know, you said that you have, you know, it's all about me, mine, and I. Uh, T is time. So there's a famous thought experiment going around is if you were offered to change your life to two people, one is a young person of 20 who's absolutely dirt poor but got faculties or an 80-year-old person who's got all the money in the world, never has to work, but is old and crotchety and got perhaps just a few years to live. So the vast majority of people say they'll be rather be a twenty-year-old, even though they're poor. They've got a ch they've got time. They got time, yeah. But as you go, time is the biggest thief because it keeps stealing time. Yeah. You, one thing money can't buy is time that's been lost. So how do you use your time? And this is one of the problems is, is in COVID-19, as people wasted their times just gorging on television, yeah. or have they used their time in the best possible way? And that leads me to another area that's run parallel to my psychiatric work is moral philosophy. I've looked at philosophy and I don't like. I like virtues of Aristotle. But the others I just found very difficult. But, but moral, in other words, how ought I live to live my life? That I think is a profound question. Yeah. How I ought to live my life, and I think there's a there's a group of millennials and and younger people say, "How can okay, we hear how ought we to live yes. my life?" And the last one is health. So it's income, relationships, time, and health. Okay. And that leads us to some very interesting. Um, ideas on what is the optimal diet yes and exercise so i've got a mat here and every day i put on some tai chi music and i do tai chi with a bit of yoga and wow at the end of it my all my joints are loose and my muscles are stronger and uh, yeah. and i walk a lot I don't, some people like to cycle but but my wife and i have been on a low carb we won't say benching or yes yeah, yeah. but um um, and we are much healthier, and um, our weight are, is at its appropriate level. Yeah. And but more the energy, the mental energy. Yes. Um, and perhaps the the most boring one, and, but the most important one is sleep. Yes. And I'm insisting that I get seven and a half to eight hours of sleep. I think COVID-19 has been cool that I don't have to get up too early. <laughs> so even if I go to sleep at half past 11 and wake up at 7, half past 7. Um, and I found that. And I think when you look at what sleep does, it just doesn't refresh you. Uh, but lots of things are going on that are being sorted out. Yeah. And one of these, uh, one of the profound ideas of the last few years is that there's a fluid called CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. Yes. So when you go to sleep, there's more of that that's released that acts like a vacuum that picks up called the waste. Yes. Now, when you don't sleep, we know we have like a brain fog. We can't think, we can't. So it's almost like sleep puts on that vacuum cleaner <laughs> okay, yeah. and, and cleans it. So, yeah. And the idea also of health is how do you de-stress? So one of the great ideas of religion is a day of rest once a week. It can be secular, can have one day. In fact, I, I had a patient, a minister in the church many years ago. I asked him, when's your day of rest? He said, Monday. <laughs> I said, why? He said, Sunday, I work hard. <laughs> and uh, him and his mates, they got to a golf course. They were allowed by the management to use, three of them. They had the golf course themselves. They closed the golf course. Okay. But he and his mates played, and that was his day of rest. Oh, so I think yes. we do need in the 24-7 uh, era is one day where we switch off our screens, we switch off our computers. 
Um, and during the day, we need to have time off our screens and do other stuff that's more natural. Yeah. The, that's exactly where I wanted to get into next is we've spoken of mindfulness and meditation, but if you could almost do a little bit of a blueprint, what would you recommend to, to people listening on just small things to improve their health, to in, improve their, their quality of life? Um, sleep's obviously very important. Everyone knows that, but not, not many people know how to get to that eight hours of good sleep. Um, what would you recommend, though, if you had to paint a bit of a blueprint of a routine, maybe some daily routines that people can use to just improve their, where to start improving their life and, uh, and their, their, their way of living? Well, I would say that the first question to, is, is contemplative. The first question is, what do you want for your life? Because once you start to answer that, I think a lot of your lifestyle changes are that much easier. If you just want to eat better, sleep better, uh, because you want to earn more money or get a promotion, well, those are going to all be secondary. Yes. But if you say, I want a quality life, I want a meaningful life, yeah. I, I'm 20, 25, 30, 40, my genes for myself, for example, suggest I get to 90. Uh, so I've got still about 30 years to go. Um, what do I want to do? How can I look at my daily routines? Um, and then that becomes like a kind of a goal. And the stronger that purpose and goal is, the easier it is to bring in lifestyles because you'll say, you know what? Yes, I like this chocolate, but I've got a family of diabetes. Yeah. I don't want to be diabetic in 20 years and have amputations, for example. I mean, that's a bit of a negative way. Yeah. So I would say that the contemplative, what I call PDL, po uh, yes. purpose-driven life, is the first meditation. In fact, in my individual work, group work, that's the first. The meditation is not on the breath. Is questions of... If I had to live my life over, how would I do it? What are the values I would die for? You know, what gives me the most meaning? What what can bring me the most happiness? And then, of course, what I'm specifically what I'm good at, what I you know um, yes. love doing, the world will pay. Then, then you you've got that. I I just think people who want a quick fix, or oh, doc, just help me meditate so I can be calmer, more relaxed, that my performance at work will be better. I think that is that be, that's part of the, the pill, yes. You know the the medication lifestyle. Just give me something. I don't want to pull, but give me a technique so I can perform better. I think that's that's not going to work. You need to have a, a longer approach to your life. Um, uh, with my kids, I'm saying to them, for example, educating their children, my grandchildren. Think about maybe when they're 22 or 25, what, what would you like them to be? Because once they're 25, they've gone. Yes. <laughs> what can you do now that when they're 20, 25, that's kind of you would have done your role in education? Because if you're looking at education that's suited for the 20th century, you're going to be wrong, for example. What are the values? What, what is the lifestyles you would like them? Their exercise, their sleep, whatever. Okay. So... I would say that's the first thing on a daily basis is to ask yourself and, and tell, what do you want from your life? Yes. What do you want? From, and then work back. It's very much the Stephen Covey, his seven habits, the second one, begin with the end in mind. Yes. You know, almost like that funeral experiment story. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you want from your life? Once you've got that, then you've got like your two bows on a, on a violin. Then you can play the music. Because okay. where you are and where you want to go. I mean, not talking about specifics. And, uh, you know, I, I want to, you know, bring my time down the Comrades Marathon. It's, it's more about health. It's yes. about, you know, the big, the big claims. Then number two, I would say the most important is to learn a meditative technique that is cheap, affordable, 
and you can push on. And that is the great anchor, stabilizer of the mind called the breath. The breath. I mean, it's a bit of a metaphor in a sense that the breath is we we breathing. We're not breathing. We are being breathed. Okay. Because if you have to stop thinking about breathing, if I said you breathe, I mean, <laughs> you'd be dead within a minute because your mind's distracted. Yeah. But it doesn't always have to be the breath, but there should be something where you pay your attention to, even if it's for just a few minutes a day, just to be fully aware. So the Zen Buddhist would say, when you're washing dishes, wash dishes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. When you're hanging up the 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 washing, hang up the washing. You know, your mind is not, oh, I have to do this because I have to do something else. Yeah. So in other words, if you ask me what is the, and once you start to do that, then you're improving your attention and your awareness. Because this is the second part. I've got two. Part of my photo now is PDL, which is a, a, a is purpose-driven life. What's your purpose in life? And the other one is ARIA, called R-E-A. Okay, yes. a bit of acronyms. But, but that's radical expanded awareness. Yes. Now, this is where the rubber hits the road. This is photo. This is extraordinary life. When you can at any moment just drop in, Kabazin talks about, you just drop in like a tennis ball. You just drop it in. You can at any moment, of course you have to be trained in this. Yes. And sometimes you do this even unconsciously. You drop in just to the moment. What is happening right now? So you, if you have a, if you're pouring water, boiling water to make herbal tea, at that moment you're just focusing on that, the water. Because most of us, we do this automatic. Yes. And when we start being automatic is we then drift into the past and the future. Once you start to do this, then you can pay better attention to is what's the best diet. And before going to sleep, you can practice a bit of mindfulness. For example, having a, a long hot bath in, 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 in winter and just feeding all that water over you. You can be mindful of that. Now, that will remove you from tomorrow's worries. Yes. Even though just for that moment. For that moment. Yes. And you kept, and it's like a, a necklace, an infinite necklace. Because from now until we die, there's infinite moments. And you just add one to another. To, what will happen is you go into automatism, but you can come back. Yeah. So that also is understanding the science of habits, which is a big, big uh, idea now, is how the brain works with habits. And, and one of them is, uh, there's four parts, briefly, is an anchor uh, is a cue, yeah, a trigger. So like that could be a a clock or a, or a hanger or, or whatever it might be, a trigger. Then you need a behavioural response that deals with that trigger. So if I hear the front door bell ringing, I will get up and look and see who it is. Yes. Okay. Uh, when you came here, you beeped the intercom. I was expecting you more or less at time. What I did was beeped and you come through. I opened the gates. Yes. Thirdly, there needs to be a reward. This is where dopamine comes in. Yes. This is addiction. <laughs> is that to build a habit, you need a reward. Okay. If you're doing mindfulness training and you're not getting a reward from it, it's not going to be long lasting. Yes. You actually have to not just the relaxation, but you'll notice as you practice, other people are relating differently to you because you're listening now with more awareness. Yes. And finally, you have to repeat it. And that's one of the biggest, biggest struggles in this lifestyle change, whether it's exercise or sleep or meditation, is to keep practicing it. Yeah. And I've noticed when I slow down my practice, it's like... Stop going to the gym. Slowly you become unfit again. Put yeah. on a bit of weight. So you need to dedicate. But what's quite cool is when I I have my mat under there, when I see it, that's a trigger. Yes. Okay. And it goes on. So in terms of lifestyle, 
let's repeat this very important i think it's a two-part process one is what do you want from your life yes i would say that's that's the most important you want to live a long life how i'm going to live it begin with the end of mind number two is okay these are the practices during a day we have to sleep we need to go to sleep we wake up then in the science of mind as it were the awareness is actually a beautiful idea that most of the day we are asleep still and when we get caught up in our future and our past we're like in a dreamlike state yeah when a person's mind's wandering you often find that they're not here mm. what they're actually in a dream they daydreaming what mindfulness does it wakes you up to the present even if you're angry even if you've got a, something to do a choice to make you're awake that this at this moment this is it i accept it i once spilled water over my pants but then i went this is it what do i do yeah go change the pants it's happened i can't take the water <laughs> yeah you know and that and um and so there's this waking up so if you look in a day let's say your day is divided by sleep so i think there's things you can do before you go to sleep one of them is to stop thinking in other words stop thinking about tomorrow stop trying to think yourself to sleep it's been shown if you can't go to sleep after 10 minutes and you're thinking just go do something else because yeah. you can't think yourself yes also when you wake up i think the first few moments minutes should not be just jump out of bed unless it's emergency but just to lie there and be aware of how you i do my body scan there yes oh it's yeah, beautiful yeah. i just i lie there with the duvet and i just different especially my lower legs and uh, that focuses me then i've got a series of things that i do but you brush your teeth you can do that mindfully yes you get dressed you get undressed you know if if you're in an intimate relationship how do you speak to each other how do, how do you start to put it not quite crudely but what's going to happen at the end of the day with your intimate partner often starts how you greeted each other in the morning morning yes you know and how you greet yourself each during the day so and then there's time to drink something or to eat something and so you can become more mindful of what you eating and that opens up a whole new area of attitudes and one of gratitude i don't do this all the time but when i have a piece of bread i sometimes where did this bread come from the yeah. farmer the miller yeah the bakery the truck driver next time you have a piece of bread think back you know, when i was at school we had one rand the we had to write essays on one rand and all the different people we went through but just take anything in your life is electricity or how many people are actually behind this technology of podcasts yes tens of thousands yeah we don't realize it um so gratitude for life for and it's a remarkable attitude now we're talking about how we change we're, we're coming back to the beginning psychiatry generosity generosity of time not just of money generosity of time the greatest gift you can give somebody is to listen you're good at it Billy. thank you to to listen i don't think you can be a good podcast if you can't listen <laughs> <laughs> um i've been interviewed on radio a good few times and some of them are so poor because they're just talking themselves they don't yes i want one of the first few times my father said but the woman didn't let you speak i wanted to hear what my son had to say yeah <laughs> um so listening generosity this thing of trust that an acceptance of what is we in COVID 19 let's accept it what can we do about it we're not going to wake up tomorrow morning and it's gone um patience you know um it's, it's a beautiful thing things will unfold in their own time and when you try to force something you're trying to pull the future into the present oh yes so patience is and this is where i get from if i have ten thousand hours of practice it's walking i've walked throughout my life um i lived in saxon i used to walk to zoo lake 
when okay. I was 12, I went with my best friend, whose father was the best friend of my father, to the first time Drakensberg, and I heard my father on the Thursday night saying to his friend, watch out for Jonathan, he likes to walk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I walked on five continents, uh, Huddle Park, I was there for four hours walking yesterday. But the... When you get into nature especially, I don't think to worship, but nature teaches you yeah. patience. We're in, we're in winter now. And in a few weeks' time, we're going to have blossoms. So you'll notice people who are much more centered, better, more patient. Yeah. And then one of the greatest things is beginner's mind, that this moment... This breath, your in-breath, has never been, never will be. Every moment is a new moment. Yes. And that's when I get it from my granddaughters that as small children, every moment's a new moment. We as adults get oh, another sup, another breath, uh, another winter. Yeah. No, this, this is the only moment we've got. And, yeah. and, and to have this attitude of a beginner's mind that's why if you ask me that knowing your purpose and just switching on that awareness, the, the, the formal is the breath. There's other ways to do it. Yeah. But just where any activity that brings you present, as I said, getting dressed, yeah. touch, all your senses, what you see, hear, smell, also just your body sense. Yeah. Um, and, and, that's why I call it radical, radical, expanded awareness because that's what wisdom is about, yeah. I think, and being wise. You can have all the knowledge, but wisdom is when you can hold things, a lot of things in the present, and these distractors of past and present and, uh, and future and um, mind-numbing social media and work that you really hate doing. Um, you know, you can just every it's like a blooming of every moment. Um, Henry David Thoreau did this two and a half year experiment at Walden Pond. He, he just went to stay at Walden, bought his own hut yeah. to front nature, okay, and found out what life's about. So that when he came to the end of his life, he would not have regrets or. On that theme yeah so when we talk about anxiety depression covered and all of this is it, it all comes really down for me is knowing your purpose <coughs> acting on it and letting the day unfold waking up to the day yes. whatever you do and even if it's tough and even if it is that you've lost your work and even if you hear that somebody's ill or someone died or whatever it might be this is the full catastrophe of life what is your relationship to life and this is what i've really looked the, you can have a wiser relationship in other words going back to uh, victor frankel between the 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 situation and your response there's a space that to me is phenomenal because especially with meditation and mindfulness and cognitive therapy and just responding to life, you can actually change your relationship to it. So you get a different response, which could be social, it could be physiological, it could be chemical, it could be political, it could be many, many things. And if we come back to one idea we as moral agents we have freedom of will and if people say you don't have freedom of will then why do we have a legal system yes why do we have a legal system just someone does something wrong do brain surgery on them or just give them medicines until they do right yeah <laughs> it's nonsense we yeah. have so what what i it brings in this whole moral philosophy into psychiatry as i said is this having this broad margin to life is how ought we to live our lives and one of that ought is that we do have freedom of will in any situation that came out of the the worst atrocities but probably the biggest 
laboratory on this, the Holocaust. And probably anybody who's been incarcerated of massive trauma, you have a choice to be a victim or just victimhood and restructure your future and then redeem your past kind of thing. So uh, it's quite a journey. And um, yeah, uh, my, my purpose is I'm good at teaching. I've been teaching all my life. I love it. What the world needs is a lot more training in awareness because awareness is not something like a, a spare part you go to a factory put in we've all got it it's, it's all potential yeah and by training you can bring it out and through that you get a, a different response i think the world will pay me um, i i i live in this world more of essentialism i'm not saying dirt poor living with dirty clothes but it's remarkable how I've dropped my my wastage of money. Yes. Um, but the world pays in different ways. And the, the greatest payment is to see someone uplifted through this process. Doc, this is the, the worst part for me of any interview I do is when I have to decide it's time to, to cut it because I think especially the, the point you've just ended on is a great point to to end the formal conversation and lead me into a, a part that i do with every guest is ask them three questions it's just nice to get the the perspective um which of the first one is the three books right now that you'd recommend to people that they should go and read The first book I would say is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey, uh, written in the 1990s. Um, I, I don't think you have to read the whole book. I think you just have to get a gist of the first three habits especially. Okay. Uh, which is being proactive, begin with the end of mind, and first things first. The second book... I would say would be Ray Dalio's Life Principles. Yes. And there he talks about the five stages. Is What's your audacious goal? It's very similar to Covey. Begin with the end, but what's your day? Call to adventure. Yeah. Then you are where you are. In a way, there's this big gap between where you are and where you want to be. Then you're going to make mistakes. And then he says, in the mistakes, is that where you learn? From that, you devise a plan to deal with that mistake, implement it, and it'll take you to a higher level. Yes. In other words, it's a fascinating take on mistakes. We're going to make mistakes. And lots of people are frozen because they don't like mistakes. Yes. The third book I would suggest is either Edith Eager's book, The Choice, yeah. or Viktor Frankl's The Will to Meaning. Yeah. And um, that is... Those books are profound in teaching you of being a moral agent, of taking responsibility yes. for your life. Viktor Frankl's book is the one that got me uh, not just interested, but almost could say with conviction that that is something I want to do for the rest of my life, going into psychology and things. Um, so I think a great book. My next question is, what are the five most important things in your life right now and given sorry that you were speaking of, of essentialism and things i think this is quite an interesting one five most important first thing that comes to my is my wife for sure um when it comes to relationships i've put her sin besides myself no, no not myself her because from that, we have all our derivatives. We have our children, we have our, they're married, three lovely daughter-in-laws, we have grandchildren, our friends, their parents, the, the daughter-in-law's parents. Um, she can do her work at the university, I can do my, but we meet, we are best friends. That, that's, I would say, would be the biggest, put it in a negative way, if that came to a loss, it would be 
Yes. The the second thing, which is probably close to, close to that, is my breath. COVID nineteen is scary because it attacks the breath. The ventilator is probably the most scariest thing, because without breath, who are we? Paul Cullen, who wrote a book from 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 breath to air. He was a neurosurgeon, who had thirty six top neurosurgeon in America got this inoperable treatment, um, a leukemia. No, sorry, lung cancer. And he lived for a couple of years and, and he decided to have a kid and the, he died when the kid was eight, but uh, eight months. But he wrote this book yes. and he talked about when breath, which is life, becomes air. Because we all share air. But only, only life can breathe. Yes. So I would say the breath. The third thing is my brain. That my fear is dementia, and without my memory systems, without being able to think, my heart might be perfect. They can do a heart transplant. They can send all my organs for to put in twenty year olds, let's say. But if I don't have my brain, if I don't have the consciousness that um, arises, the the fourth thing. I would say my sensory system, especially my ears and my eyes. And that if you think of it, you've got two, like three millimeter apertures that you can take in the the stars, yeah. the whole world, books, every, billions of words of it all go through these eyes uh, and, and sounds. Where are we now? That's th th uh, three. Sorry, that's no, four, four. four. That's four, yes. So uh, this with my wife, my uh, breath, my breath, my brain, and yes. then my two. Then, um, then I still have time. That I still have time. Uh, I don't. I don't fully know when that time will end, but it will end. But I do have time, and. Um, Time is where change takes place. If 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 you think of it, if time was frozen, we couldn't change. Yeah. So time is where we can change from moment to moment. Yeah, and is that it? Yeah, that's five. Yeah. For me. That last one just got me thinking. I, it's a very interesting point you made there. Mm. Um, my last question on this is, if you think back, and maybe it touches in with time, um, yourself as a young man, maybe in his 20s, maybe in his teens, what was the one message that if you could speak to that young man now, what would you give to him? Yo. Radically expand your awareness. In other words, be mindful, be present. And when you do that, you'll realize that there's many things you can't control. And the only thing that you can control is your choice of being aware. 